So this is about uh, research and development on a budget. Uh, I am Luke Dickin. Uh, you can feel free to heckle me on Twitter at, <laughs> at LukeD. Um, so I'm today in this talk, uh, I'm going to be from the Strathclyde AI and Games Research Group. It's going to change a few times uh, as we go through the day. Um, and I'm also representing the AI Special Interest Group. Um, and to begin with, let's make the case for why we need some R&D. Um, so I'm going to start out by saying that the development of new techniques is vital to the continued success of the industry. And this is a bit of a contentious thing, so I'll qualify it with a maybe. Um, so, I mean, new stuff drives sales, and it's driving, sort of moving everything forwards. Um, now, as an entertainment medium, people might argue that books haven't really advanced in however many years, so maybe r and is not that important. But, I mean, essentially, technology is progressing. And the way that we use that technology and the way that we develop for that technology has to keep up with that. Um, and the other thing is that increasing horsepower means we can do cool things. We can sort of tap into that horsepower to do stuff that we haven't done before. Uh, and that means research and it means development. Um, okay, next slide. Why R&D sucks? Um, by its nature, R&D is high risk. You set off trying to do something and it turns out it's not possible, or it turns out that it's actually going to take 100 times as long and it'll cost 100 times as more. That's not good. Um, it's also expensive. I mean, you are just sort of pumping money into a black hole. Um, in a sort of business commercial kind of sense, it's not something that you can say, ah, for our next game, we are going to have this. So it's not something that you can bind to one project and say, this is an investment for this project. Because it could be a long-term investment. It could come to nothing. Um, and sort of tied in with that, if the clicky will click. There we go. Um, R&D does not fit in with project life cycles. It's awkward and very frustrating. And generally, if you try to make it fit, it will deliberately go out of its way to make sure that it doesn't. Um, combine all of that. And you've got something that is really hard to justify to senior management, to shareholders. Why are we spending all this money on this thing that may not work and is going to sort of only sort of add something that nobody has seen before and nobody really cares about today? Well, down the line, it's going to be important. But today, in terms of short term, in terms of project sort of justification, it's very hard to get it through. With that said... Most projects that I've sort of talked to people about end up having a wouldn't it be nice if system. You know, uh, wouldn't it be nice if the NPCs in this game could walk up to us and actually interact with us in a meaningful way? Wouldn't it be nice if the trading system in this game was actually modeled properly and the simulations all worked? Um, stuff like that typically ends up getting cut because, you know, wouldn't it be nice if isn't essential. So budget and time constraints come up quite a bit. Um, conflicts with other features. So wouldn't it be nice if, well, yes, but we're doing this thing over here and those two are not sort of going to match up. So you know, we end up in a situation where we cut one in favor of the other. Not being well perceived. So this thing where like, people don't know that they should care about whatever. Um, and it, we've seen this quite a few times in, in the sort of last few years, where things are moving so fast that the sort of gamers don't realize that things are cool until they actually have them in their hands and go, oh, well, this actually is cool. Um, and then sort of the, the main thing that I want to talk about today is wouldn't it be nice if, but we don't know how to do it and we've not got the skill set and we don't want to hire people who have that skill set because they're expensive. Okay, academic research, here we go. Um, academic projects have long-term sort of time frames. We're talking years. Uh, for PhD students, we're talking a lot of years. I don't want to get into it. Um, we have a tendency to get bogged down in sort of ivory towers thinking. We, we sort of get into a little abstract problem and disappear down a rabbit hole, and um, then we don't actually have anything worth anything at the end of the day. Um, and we've got no sense in of the realities of the industry. I mean, academics are terrible for sort of deciding what the problem is in industry, and not just in the games industry. They do this all over the place. Um, this is what your problem is. Let me tell you how to solve it. Well, that's not actually my problem. Um, 
so the, there was one uh, a couple of months ago, um, a, a battery scheduling problem with the uh, whole power plant system, and sat down through the presentation, and at the end of it, it, it involved switching power systems like every millisecond or something, and somebody said, well, is the, is the hardware actually capable of doing that? Oh, no, the hardware can only switch every 10 milliseconds. You haven't actually solved the problem then. Um, and consequently, I mean, these academics sort of end up looking down their nose at industry and at state-of-the-art in industry and saying, well, this is all shit. Uh, and it's because they don't actually understand what industry is doing and the reality. I mean, so my background in AI, yes, academic AI can sort of do all these fancy decision-making systems if you give it half an hour and seven gigs of RAM. You know, we don't have that. Um, and the thing about academic research is that it's often funded by public sector grants. Um, so, I mean, you just have to read a newspaper to know that public sector is getting squeezed hard. Uh, and if you try and justify games research, it turns out that a lot of people don't really get on board with that because you're not saving lives and, you know, you're not sort of inventing new things and you're not discovering the secrets of the universe. So they decide that they don't care. Um, collaboration between academics and industry makes a lot of sense, kind of. Um, because for industry, what it means is you get cheap R&D. Um, so setting up a joint project with a, a PhD student. PhD students in the UK cost £13,000, which is um, a ballpark $20,000. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of like half what, if you actually employed somebody, that would cost. And it's R&D, so depending on your local government laws, that could be a tax write-off. And there's a good chance that you can make it sort of half-funded by saying... Uh, you know, industry is really supportive of this, and then the public sector gets on board with it if it's like half funded. Um, it alleviates your risk because you're reducing your exposure to, to any sort of uh, badness from the project going south. Um, and for academia, what it gives us is applications oriented research. And in games, that's really important, and it's really easy to sell it to academics, uh, or at least student academics, because I get to work on a real game, that's amazing. Um, versus I get to hack around in Unity and pretend like it's a real game. Um, I'm not bitter about it. Um, <laughs> it gives us a, a source of funding outside of the traditional model. It gives us a way of actually getting money into universities that are getting squeezed. And both sides are going to get this tangible deliverable at the end. They're going to get something that they can point to and say, we did that. Um, and that is awesome. But there are some potential pitfalls, and most of them concerning academics. Um, choosing who to work with is really important. I mean, don't work with people who aren't actually capable of delivering. Make sure that they know, or that they have a full view of how the project fits into the larger scheme of things, so that they don't sort of disappear off down a rabbit hole of, you know, oh, well, you know, let's do this, that, and the other. And well, no, this was the problem. Um, so keep them on track, especially if you've put money up front, you know, keep checking in, make sure that they're doing stuff that's actually relevant. One of the things that I've found in talking to industry, uh, particularly about this topic, is that there is a very different pacing between the two, and you have to be aware and upfront about that, um, because expectations are very different, and uh, sort of, it's a cultural thing. It kind of comes back a little bit to Kate's stuff. It, it, there is this two different cultures coming together, and you kind of have to be very transparent in the way that you bridge that. And finally, don't pin your hopes and dreams and your entire success of your project on the academics coming up with something. Um, because often they don't. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's R&D and it's academics, and you combine the two, and it all goes horribly wrong on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, but it's great if you can bring in your, your wouldn't it be nice if projects. Wouldn't it be nice if this? Well... Maybe three years down the line, that's something that you can put into uh, a, a real game. So we've been talking with a AAA developer who do a global motor racing franchise that will not be named, but may or may not be G2. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, what can, what can they do just now? Well, their AI could be improved. We can improve that with what we're doing, but we're not going to get it in this year's iteration. We're not going to get it in next year's iteration. We may get it into 2013, 2014, if everything works out. 
and everything so far hasn't really worked out on that one. It's not a good one to bring up in a, in a talk selling this stuff. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, to, to just in, in summary of, of what I've been saying, so public sector funding for academic research is disappearing, particularly for games. Um, but we still need the stuff that's going to come out of industry. So a lot of the things that we take for granted today are things that originally came out of academia. A-star search is an academic technique. I mean, even just games themselves are from academics messing about with mainframes way back in the day. So you, can, you could, theoretically, in an ideal world, uh, combine industry, support academic projects, and this gives you a cost-effective way to do innovation. Um, whether or not you're actually running a project, I would encourage everybody to engage with academia. Um, just talk to people. Talk to, talk to the guys doing the research because they'll want to talk to you and it helps to sort of guide what they're doing and, and even just make it a little bit more relevant. And that's good in itself, whether or not you're actually funding a, a specific project. So just to wrap up a slightly different topic, academic uh, engagement is vital not just for research. So I've been talking about research for the last 11 minutes, so I need to wrap up quick. Um, Actually, you're the last person, so we've got a little... Oh, okay, excellent. Well, I'll talk slow then. Um, <laughs> we need to keep game dev teaching relevant. We need to engage not just with research, but also with teaching. Um, so in November, uh, as part of the Alt Dev Conference series, uh, we're running an online event that is outreach from industry to the global student committee, uh, student body. So a lot of people engage with their local universities. They sort of visit and give a talk about something that they're doing. Uh, and what we're trying to do is put that all online and get them engaging in a broader sense with, with more people. And you can find out more or you can submit a proposal to that at uh, bit.ly uh, bit slash altdevstudents. Um, so yeah, so that's everything I have to say. Here is my contact information. I am an AI guy, as you will find out later on this afternoon. Uh, so if you want to talk about AI collaborations, I'm all for that. But if you want to talk about this in general, uh, at Luke D, Luke at cis.strat.ag.uk. Um, and uh, you can come learn why AI is awesome at uh, 3 p.m. today in the Senate room. Thank you very much. So is there any conflict between the fact that most research needs to have a paper with the book and the confidentiality that, that most... So, it, you can it's kind of skirt around that a little bit. You can talk in abstract terms in your paper a little bit. Um, it doesn't have to be exact. But the other thing is that like, even just getting the paper out there, you kind of, effectively, it's like a patent, right? I mean, it's not necessarily patented, but you are sort of stamping your name on it and saying, this company this and this university have done this. Lots of ways to be cloned, and that's probably yeah. <laughs> open sourcing. Um, have you seen any successful collaborations where the result is commercialized? For example, on the asset store for Unity or something like that? I probably should have picked up a few examples and kept them in my head for talking about this, but no, uh, not off the top of my head. They're, I know they exist, yeah, okay. um, but I couldn't point to one just now off the, off no, the top I just, of my head. I mean, it seems like that's a driver in terms of return on investment. For sure. Business. You know, heck, at least we'll break even on this. We'll have some money to yeah. roll, roll into the next I mean, field. So, I mean, the asset store is... is particularly something that uh, we're looking at. Yeah. Because, I mean, for AI stuff, we can sort of package up, this is a, a behavior system, uh, and it's available in the asset store, blah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that kind of thing is where things are heading, definitely. <laughs> With this uh, rampant emergence and uh, progression of gamification across all sorts of business models and cultural facets, people trying to in inject gamification into all sorts of principles, you're seeing uh, the economic driver being a pusher in this to what we're doing. Hey, apply this to our school system. Hey, apply this to our product development. And it's not going to be long before there's going to be that component in academia where they're uh, sitting there trying to figure out what it's all about or why it's working or how it's changing our psychology. Do you see gamification uh, at least uh, being one of those components that will pull academia? Because they have to put their final word on it just like the nightly news has to tell you exactly why things happen in a short little bit. Someone's going to wait and someone's going to want to have a, oh, there's a PhD says yes, 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 this is it. And then bam, on to the thing, but you see that, like all these new trends that are coming up around the fact that games are becoming socially acceptable or just straight up an economic monster. Yeah. 
Um, a little bit. I mean, I think that one of the problems we have in academia is that when we're writing our grant proposals and stuff, we are dealing with crotchety old scientists who are very stuck in their ways. Uh, this has been recorded, isn't it? Shit. We didn't name names. So, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, in, in terms of traditional academia, it's, it's difficult to get traction still because, I mean, these are guys who, yes, gamification is getting big, not in their world. Yeah. Um, and, and even trying to sort of... So I come from a, more of a traditional university. We have no game dev program. And trying to justify even sort of coming here is hard. Trying to justify get to GDC is hard. I mean, it's not stuff that they're really on board with just out of the box, and you kind of really have to give it a hard sales pitch. Yeah, but they can't, they can't deny the fact that we're probably going to be close to, if not exceed $100 billion in, in games just in the United States. It's great. Ah, it's yes, but, but so it's that's... It's not about justifying it, but it no, actually is there. They just, but, you know, that's not pure research. That's not science. That's not maths. That's not stuff on a whiteboard. That's horrible. That's not theory that can't be... Exactly. Absolutely. Because we've all got the technology. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, uh, no they, that's, that's what right. they thrive on. Is, is the I mean, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You know, you think that even academics or even university systems, the reason why game dev programs are popping up all over schools is because it's such a huge driving force and it's what the students or consumers want. Yes. Academic, even though teaching but there are still a yeah. lot of universities that don't have that model. And they don't see it as a consumer-oriented thing. They see it as we are our ivory tower, right. uh, and and we will do maths and we will do applied maths when we have to, and we will dip into computer science. But really, we want to stick in lambda calculus. Sure. Um, are there any foundations or anybody who's getting it from the game to academia arena for grants? Or is there any is there any funding sources yet? That are I, I mean, so I, I don't Obviously know. You don't want to give those up. <laughs> um, so I don't know so much about the US state of play. In the UK, it's hard. We have to go through um, like technology councils still. So there isn't a specific games thing. Um, it's, we have uh, Digro, uh, which is uh, sort of doing a bit of stuff, and Tiger, which is the trade organization. But they're not really doing much in that direction, and we do end up going back to sort of the more classical ways of getting funding. Uh, so it's something that needs to come in, I think. There are instances where uh, governments are engaging academia, like the, um, the Gambit Lab. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and, you know, that's Singapore. And then, uh, oh, geez, what's the other one? I, I'm, I'm out from Boston, so there's a lot of schools that are trying to get their little niche. Mass Digi, for example, like DigiNet here with Massachusetts, which are the leading CCC. Mm -hmm. You know, at Becker College, private school, but Massachusetts Health APA. There's, there are little instances, and I think it's, it's on the verge. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's starting to come through now. Uh, for industry collaboration, I mean, so again, in the UK, we have sort of great master's programs in some universities. Um, so we have Gamer Camp and we have the University of Abate, who are doing great things. But a lot of the time when they're actually engaged with industry, they are more looking at it as an internship kind of thing, rather than let's sort of drive things forward. They're just sort of putting bodies into there for, for maybe six months and unpaid bodies and, and seeing it more as that side of things, they're not really, certainly in the UK, they're not engaging so much with the research side. I wonder what would happen if like, some top 10 school, let's say, say MIT had a bunch of Google uh, game, game students and they're the ones that released Angry Birds and all of a sudden, like, boom, it's, you can't deny this. Oh, and by the way, the school happens to own it because it was done in school. Yeah. You know? Oh, that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I was actually thinking that the IP ownership it, it's certainly you know, something initial that initial negotiations yeah, to make sure absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and not to suggest that you know just because an economic success is going to fuel academic research. Not, not to say that yeah. one would be in the other, but you just those things usually are influencers. Yeah, that's a good PR story. Coming from a background absolutely. in geology, we have you know uh, Exxon Mobil built entire buildings for our our school. You know, then they come right to the school and they're funding research programs. You know, sometimes for better or for worse, you, know, you can have oh you're my scientist. You're The industry is giving the research ability and like funding these researchers to go do build research or have students. Well, yeah, so I mean, we do see it in all sorts of industries already. How long? How long till this monster of an economic force is going to just? There used to be a conference called State of Play. I don't know if you 
Facebook has a code. Is it still in existence? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard it. It was going back and forth between Canada and the United States mm -hmm. and different universities. And they were trying to deal with original research transferring into the game industry. And there was a great AI project at one point. Um, back yeah. in there, but I've been around too long. Um, <laughs> thank you, Luke. I, I think this obviously uh, is a huge topic that deserves a, a lot more conversation. So. Cool.